August 5th. Today, from the early morning, it was sunny. The heat was so intense that even in the shade, there was no escape from the relentless scorching rays. The wind barely stirred the leaves of the olive trees frozen in stillness. And the sky was so bright and cloudless that it seemed as if an artist had spilled their paint across the heavens. The street thermometer showed 28 degrees Celsius. Only fans provided relief. On the street with a small number of houses lived three families and a lonely old man named Oscar Moreno. Diaz. It struck nine, and in one of the houses on this street, the whole family had gathered at the table half an hour ago. It consisted of three people. The family members were having breakfast and enjoying their day off. Their surname was Diaz. The husband and wife were discussing what they could give their neighbor, Benjamin Navarro. After all, tomorrow was supposed to be his birthday. So, a party was planned, to which everyone was invited except for the old man, Oscar Moreno. Well, what do you suggest we give Benjamin, asked Martina Diaz, pouring freshly brewed coffee into her cup, and then into her husband's cup. Well, perhaps some good tech, replied Castor Diaz. Tech? Yes. I think he already has plenty of different gadgets, Martina laughed. He seemed to enjoy photography. Then maybe we should give him a professional camera, suggested Castor Diaz. I think that's a good idea. Although he had some old camera before. But now he'll have a new one, and moreover, a professional one, said Martina. Dominic, stop playing at the table. Martina shifted her attention to their 10-year-old son. Are you going to eat today? Dominic paused, but then resumed playing with his toy car. Dominic, you need to listen to your mom, Castor said, handing him a newspaper. Come on, eat. The boy glanced around to make sure no one was watching and gave a little meat from his breakfast to the dog, which was lying on the floor, sticking out its tongue from the heat. Dominic didn't always like to eat in the mornings, so he fed the pet. Dominic, I see everything, the man said, still reading the newspaper. Then he quickly put it down and looked at his son. Castor smiled at him and brought the cup to his lips. At that moment, Martina approached the sink to wash the dishes. There was a window above the sink, overlooking the street. After a moment, Martina let out a short laugh and stopped washing the plates. What's so funny? Castor asked with interest, setting aside the newspaper and shifting his gaze from his son to his wife. Oh, old man Oscar is out again. Wandering down the street and collecting empty bottles. He's humming something there too. Same old, same old, Martina replied. Castor walked over to his wife, finding the scene equally amusing. They often observed the lonely old man, who lived in a house on the same street, wandering around and collecting bottles. Each neighbor, including the Diaz family, had their own habit, which they had long been accustomed to. This habit involved throwing garbage into his yard for a laugh. They knew for sure, the old man definitely wasn't offended. He didn't care. The old man had no wife, no children. He was 60 years old. All that was known about him was that he moved to this town in the early 2010s and settled in an empty house. He never wanted to make friends, but he didn't hold any grudges either. He was neutral, unlike his neighbors. He was doing just fine, or so everyone thought. But the neighbors saw him as a simple beggar, a in ear do well with nothing going for him in life, just existing. They believed he had no interests, goals, or meaning in life. He seemed to them to serve no purpose and sometimes even irritated them with his presence. No one liked him. Yet, there was no apparent reason for such treatment. The old man hadn't done anything wrong. Except perhaps occasionally, at night, he enjoyed humming the same song while playing his guitar. He sang rather well, but even this small detail didn't endear him to the neighbors. Sometimes people need very little reason not to love someone unremarkable and ordinary. Where did he even get that guitar, the neighbors often wondered. Maybe he stole it from someone. That's probably it. Everyone nearby was also convinced that he was drunk every night. Not just on weekends or specific days and holidays. 
every single night. Perhaps they drew this conclusion from his behavior. Oscar Moreno was just often cheerful and joyful. But whether he was truly drunk, no one could confirm. In the summertime, Oscar almost always wore the same clothes, pants, a shirt, and a straw hat. Does he ever buy new clothes for himself? No, what's the point? It was known that he hadn't worked anywhere for a long time. But no one knew what he did before, if he ever worked at all. This old man was both a mystery and a simpleton. Parents never let their children near him. For some reason, they had no trust in this old man. And all of this was fabricated by the neighbors themselves. There was no visible evidence that he was a bad person and that children should never be allowed near him. It just happened. People rarely liked ones like Oscar Moreno. But why? What will he teach them? What could he possibly teach children? How to collect the best bottles in the neighborhood and drink cheap alcohol, they laughed. But not everyone felt so categorically about this old man. There was only one person who didn't see anything wrong or awful in him. He didn't see a miserable beggar or a poor simpleton in a straw hat drinking at night. He simply saw a kindly old man playing good songs on his guitar. That person was Matteo Navarro. He was the son of Benjamin Navarro. Alonso. Pablo and Ines Alonso had just woken up. They were a young couple who had recently tied the knot. They were both 23 years old. They didn't like Mr. Moreno either. Look, darling. Moreno never misses a beat. Always collects his bottles right on time, the young woman said with a sharp tone. It seems he's really hard up if he's collecting them. Or maybe just bored. No family, no interests. Nothing, Pablo replied. Yeah, you're right. By the way, what should we get Benjamin as a gift? I don't know. Let's stop by the hardware store today and see if we find anything there. Sure, let's do that, Ines said and kissed Pablo. Navarro. August 6th. In the Navarro household, which was the closest to the home of the solitary old man named Oscar Moreno, today was a long-awaited celebration, Benjamin Navarro's 40th birthday. Three members of the Navarro family, along with the arriving guests, were already fully immersed in celebrating the birthday. The air was filled with an atmosphere of merriment, joy, and leisure. The guests were in high spirits. Everyone joked around and engaged in conversations on various topics. The table was adorned with various delicious dishes. There were tacos, enchiladas, churros, pumpkin empanada sapapillas, and chicken burritos. Alcohol-wise, there were tequila, mezcal, and beer. And for the children, there was watermelon juice and champarito. As it was said, Benjamin had a 10-year-old son named Mateo and a wife named Ursula. Besides the invited guests, neighbors also came to the celebration. Martina and Castor with their child Dominic. The young couple, Pablo and Ines Alonso. An hour had passed since the beginning of the celebration. Nothing special happened until one moment. Well, my dear friends, I'm glad everyone could come and join me for the celebration. I really appreciate it. Let's have a toast. Benjamin said, raising his glass. Hurrah, everyone cheered. And I'm really impressed with your gifts, Benjamin said with a slightly tipsy voice. Honestly, I don't know which one is better. Each one is better than the last. Everyone laughed. By the way, who lives in the neighboring house, one of Benjamin's work friends asked. Oh, it doesn't matter, Ursula waved cheerfully. A beggar and a drunkard, Ines said with a laugh, hugging Pablo. Is that true? Of course. Yesterday he probably collected a record number of bottles, Martina said. Because he was clanging them all morning. As usual. He's probably already selling them, Castor chuckled. He wasn't around today. Surprisingly. If he's not visible now, we'll hear him at night. He'll start strumming his guitar again, Benjamin said. Sometimes it's unbearable. But I think he sings and plays great. Everyone immediately fell silent. 
The guests looked at the one who spoke those words. What? Benjamin asked. His face showed slight astonishment. He sings great, Matteo repeated, his voice less confident now. Isn't that right? Okay, son, go play with Dominic outside for a bit, Ursula said, seeing Benjamin's expression. It wouldn't be accurate to say Benjamin became overly angry when he drank alcohol. But it wouldn't be right to say he was pleased when things were said with which he disagreed. He never hit his wife or child, but he could start a scandal to prove his point. Matteo didn't wait long and went outside with Dominic, who was already standing at the door. Benjamin, calm down, Ursula said quietly, with a forced smile on her face, as the children left. I'm calm, Benjamin fake laughed. Perhaps the guests believed it, but Ursula certainly didn't. She knew it wasn't true. Well, if our son likes how that old man strums, then he likes it. It's his choice, Benjamin concluded, taking a gulp of alcohol. Mm, listen. Maybe we should have another party soon. We'll gather in someone's backyard, Martina changed the subject. We haven't done something like this together for a long time, except for today, of course. I think it's not a bad idea, Ursula said. And we're in two, Ines and Pablo agreed. Then everyone switched to discussing the next topic. How are you? asked Ursula, approaching her husband. He was now standing away from everyone at the table, pouring himself a drink. I'm great. Just great. You're not going to be upset with your own son because of this nonsense, are you? No, I'm not. I told you, everything's fine. I don't think so, Ursula said and returned to the guests. Another half hour passed. Surprisingly, the weather that day wasn't very sunny. And now it seemed like rain was imminent. The sky had already clouded over. Benjamin had almost completely forgotten about the whole situation and continued to enjoy his day, discussing something with his friends and colleagues. They had managed to discuss dozens of things already. When the rain began to gather, Dominic dashed back into the house to grab a drink. Dominic, is it raining out there? Ursula asked, seeing the boy. No, but it's about to, he replied. Then called Matteo into the house. Dominic didn't reply, nor did he go outside. He seemed to be in a daze. Dominic, what are you waiting for? Go get Matteo. Um, Dominic? He's just talking to Oscar, the boy reluctantly replied. Only then did he realize that he could have just called his friend instead of saying that. Oscar? Benjamin asked. All the guests went outside. And now everyone finally saw the old man. Those who had never seen him before and those who saw him every day. He was standing next to Matteo near the edge of the road, closer to the Navarro's house. Both of them were chatting and laughing happily. Oscar, what the hell are you talking to our kid for? Benjamin shouted. Dad, he didn't do anything, Matteo said, turning quickly to face his father with a frightened voice. Matteo, you don't understand much yet. Please go inside, the father said, clearly agitated. But, Matteo, go inside and take Dominic with you. Matteo's face immediately fell. He took the kite that had been in Oscar's hands before. When the boys disappeared behind the door, Benjamin spoke again, turning to the old man and forcing a smile. His hands were by his sides, a stance that usually indicated dissatisfaction. Then he lit a cigarette and exhaled smoke in Oscar's face. We seem to have told you not to approach or talk to our son, Oscar, Benjamin said slowly. His tone indicated as if he was talking to someone deranged. Benjamin, Ursula said quietly. Wait. Matteo just asked for help with untangling the kite. I barely spoke to him, Oscar calmly replied. Is that so? Then you should have just ignored him altogether, Benjamin said. Understand us correctly. We don't approve of you approaching our children at all. And of living here, in general. And what's the reason? Oscar asked calmly. Tell me, why do you hate me so much? You want a reason? 
Frankly, we just don't like you. You wander around here with your bottles, jingling them. You drink every day. I don't drink, Oscar said, adjusting his hat, in the same calm voice. But that's not how it seems to us. Anyway, I think you understand, and there's no need to explain further, Benjamin said. Have a good day, the man forced a smile again. Everyone returned back to the house. Oscar stood by the road in the same spot for some time. His expression was sorrowful. Then it turned indifferent altogether. Oscar didn't care that the rain had started a while ago. He was preoccupied with something else. August 7th, 12.30 a.m. The guests had left just after midnight. But when only the residents of the houses on this street remained, they gathered again. They gathered and threw their trash into the old man's yard. Mateo observed this scene vividly from his window on the second floor. He could never understand why everyone constantly dumped garbage in the yard of this old man. What had he done? He seemed like a good and kind person. What was wrong? If his parents allowed, he would have liked to spend time with him instead. But it was not meant to be. August 9th. On Benjamin's birthday, all the families agreed to meet at someone's backyard. It was decided to have a mini party at Castor and Martinez. Until the ninth, everyone continued to throw garbage into Oscar's yard. Surprisingly, it was always clean there. They constantly littered his yard, and he constantly cleaned it. Himself. The old man never asked why the neighbors behaved like that. Maybe he thought it would be pointless. It's strange, after your birthday, the old man hasn't sung at night even once. And he seems to be seen less often, Castor said. Doesn't it matter to you at all? Benjamin asked. Well, I don't know, maybe I like his songs, Castor said with a serious face, then laughed out loud a second later. Don't scare me like that, Castor. I'm worried about you, Benjamin replied. Well, what can I say, the man continued. Okay, okay. Dominic and Matteo played with the Diaz family dog. Suddenly, Matteo noticed a familiar figure walking down the road. It was him. The universally disliked old man. Oh, here he is. Again, this old man walks here and annoys me, Martina said, adjusting her glasses. She brought a glass of alcohol to her lips. Hey, Oscar, where have you been? We haven't heard your howling for a while, Benjamin shouted immediately. Everyone laughed. Everyone except Matteo. And Dominic didn't pay attention to what was happening at all. Okay, come join us. We're having some sort of party here, Benjamin said, flipping a fajita steak on the grill. The old man approached a little closer. Here, don't be shy. Sit here. Matteo felt happier. He approached the table and took a tortilla. The boy looked at Oscar and smiled at him. The old man smiled back. What will you have? Juice, beer, tequila? Juice. Truthfully, I overreacted back then, and I don't deny it, Benjamin said, handing Oscar a glass of juice. I'm sorry. But unexpectedly, whether by accident or not, after the words were spoken, Benjamin spilled juice on the old man's shirt. Now it was completely stained. Oh, I'm so sorry. Everyone laughed again. At that moment, Matteo became sad again, and the smile vanished from his face. He seemed disappointed about something. August 10th. Ursula was returning from her vacation today, so she spent the whole morning getting ready for work. Meanwhile, Benjamin and Matteo were having breakfast in the kitchen. Dad, why do you always throw trash into Oscar's yard? Matteo asked unexpectedly. Benjamin set down his fork. Son, believe me, he doesn't care. We do it for fun and amusement, Benjamin replied, surprised by his son's question. But it seems to me he doesn't find it funny, said Matteo. And yesterday he didn't find it funny when you spilled juice on his shirt. Mateo, don't dwell on it. Did you want to visit Martina and Castor today? Play with Dominic? 
Benjamin decided to change the subject. Yes, I wanted to. Benjamin had never really thought about why they started throwing trash into Oscar's yard. But his little son, on the contrary, became interested in it. Mateo was already in Dominic's room. They were playing a board game. Aren't you sorry for Oscar? Mateo asked. I don't even know. Mom and Dad are always talking about him like that. Like what? Different things. Yesterday, Dad spilled juice on his shirt. You saw it. I think he was really upset. Probably. And on Dad's birthday, he yelled at Oscar for no reason. Uh-huh. Mateo didn't talk about Oscar anymore. Because it was clear that Dominic couldn't care less about him. At night, everyone woke up from loud noises. They all ran outside. It was Oscar setting off fireworks from his backyard. Has this old man lost his mind completely? Benjamin asked. We need to call the police, Ursula said. At that moment, everything stopped. August 11th. 11.36 p.m. Mateo was suddenly pulled out of sleep by something. He woke up to bright flashing lights shining brightly from the street. The boy slowly got out of bed and approached the window. An ambulance was parked near Oscar's fence. Paramedics were carrying him on a stretcher. The old man himself was conscious. The boy was scared to see the ambulance. But then he quickly became relieved to see that Oscar was alive. Mateo debated for a long time whether to go to his parents and tell them about it. Apparently, they hadn't woken up yet. It was decided to tell them tomorrow. August 11th, 9 a.m. In the morning, the boy quickly went downstairs. His parents had not slept for a long time. But they were strangely silent. There was a fresh newspaper on the table next to them. Mateo wanted to talk about the old man, but he didn't have time. How is this possible? Ursula asked her husband. I don't know, dear. We never knew anything about him, and now we're finding out such things from some newspaper. Alonzo's house. Pablo. What, darling, the guy asked cheerfully, entering the kitchen. But as soon as he saw Inessa's face, the cheerfulness vanished from his face. Pablo, was it really him? Pablo slowly picked up the newspaper and read the article from beginning to end. I never knew who he was. And it was him. It was the old man we constantly humiliated and threw garbage at. Ines. It was him. It was Oscar. Do you understand? Ines said, tears in her eyes, in a hysterical tone. Darling. And we were throwing trash into his yard, she repeated over and over again. Pablo embraced the girl tightly. Diaz's house. We need to gather everyone and go to the hospital immediately, Castor said. When the whole family gathered, he put the newspaper on the table, and the three of them left the house together. Article about the forgotten hero. According to preliminary data, today Oscar Moreno, 60, was brought to the hospital. It turns out that in the past, he was a person of great stature. It is known that many years ago he lost his family in a fire. After that, he did not give up and continued to work in the fire department, saving many people and children. According to newly received information, one of the girls he saved as a child lives nearby. At noon, all the residents of the three houses gathered together. Dash, how is any of this even possible? Everything that is written in the article. Dash, I just can't believe it. I'm still in shock. Dash, is it really true? Dash, then we're all complete idiots. Dash, we need to go to him urgently. And ask him to tell us everything. Dash, if he even wants to talk to us and doesn't send us away. All three families finally gathered together. With anxiety, they drove to the hospital. Various feelings of worry and immense guilt overwhelmed their minds. They had lived alongside a man who had dedicated almost his entire life to saving other people, yet they had littered his yard with garbage. He had lost his family in a fire, and they had thought he was never needed by anyone. 
At the hospital, they were told that Oscar had a minor concussion from falling at home but managed to call an ambulance himself. Now, the man was resting peacefully and was due to be discharged. You can take him if you are his friends, the doctor said. Yes, of course. Finally, the old man emerged from the ward. He had been the sole topic of conversation for these three families, and now he stood before them. Oscar was greatly bewildered. What? What are you doing here? Oscar asked incredulously, already putting on his familiar straw hat. And you all came together. Are you going to litter here too? Oscar. Oscar, we all know about you. Well, not all. Just what was written in the newspaper. Oscar paused for a few seconds. So, what do you want? We want forgiveness. We're interested in knowing what happened to you. Very interested. Of course, if you want to tell us. And even if you don't forgive us, we want to know that you're okay. We'll never litter your yard again. We'll always help you with money if necessary. Oscar, please forgive us. Please. We were real jerks and idiots. Please forgive us. Suddenly, from the crowd, Ines approached Oscar. Oscar, is it true? What's written in the article about saving the little girl? And that she lives next door to you. So, that's me? Well, my dear neighbors, I'll tell you everything, but definitely not here. And it will take an hour, or even two. Even ten. Do you really forgive us? Are you ready to tell us your personal truth? To reveal yourself after what we've done? I'm not sure yet. We'll see, the old man chuckled. They all headed to their familiar street. Oscar himself suggested they go to his house. It's so beautiful here, Martina said, looking around. She wasn't the only one who thought so. There were many photos and frames on the sideboard in the living room. They depicted children and a young girl. On the table lay that same guitar. Oscar instructed everyone to sit in comfortable seats. For about five minutes, he simply remained silent, as if pondering everything that had happened that morning. Was it even necessary to tell them about his life? Perhaps it was worth it. At least for the purpose of finally making them understand him. To learn the real truth. After five minutes of contemplation, Oscar smiled kindly. He looked again at the entire living room where the neighbors had gathered. Their eyes showed sorrow, and it seemed they wanted to repent even more. Sincerely, without mockery or laughter. Then Oscar looked at Matteo. His eyes were the most fervent. It was evident he was in strong anticipation. The man always knew that this boy treated him somehow differently. Not like everyone else. The old man approached the dresser and took one of the frames. It depicted a very beautiful girl. Now, he seemed to care little about how the neighbors had treated him all this time. He just wanted to pour out his soul. Yesterday, I set off fireworks. You must have heard and probably were very displeased. I understand you. But it wasn't just for no reason. I wanted to honor the memory of someone very dear to me. Many years ago, on the 10th of August, I lost my love. My only love and my children. Now everyone felt even more uneasy. Oh, Elisa. Oscar said with pleasure and blissfully closed his eyes for a couple of seconds. He settled more comfortably in the armchair and opened his eyes again. My muse, liar, and Aphrodite. The best and most unique dream, which was destined to come true for a very short time in this long fleeting life. It was the best time spent with the bright angel. She seemed to descend from heaven, and after a while, she returned back. Oscar continued dreamily. I first saw her in the late 1970s, entering the Institute. I don't know how it happened, but I felt momentarily overwhelmed with happiness. Warmth spread through my chest, as if my heart had been illuminated with something bright and sincere. It all happened in the Institute's lobby. In a second, I froze like a pillar. I was mesmerized by her enchanting eyes. They were like two dark whirlpools. Beautiful brown eyes, 
in which I saw the whole world, as I understood later. Elisa stood six meters away from me, chatting with another girl. Suddenly, she noticed me, but quickly averted her gaze. And I kept looking. Another second passed, she said goodbye to her interlocutor and looked at me again. Elisa smiled sweetly and went out onto the street. And I kept standing like a pillar, mouth agape. It was only five minutes after she left that I came to my senses. I ran out onto the street, but it was too late. She was nowhere to be found. Neither on the porch nor on the road. Now, after that day, all my thoughts were only about the beautiful nymph with chestnut hair and deep brown eyes. And the days went by and on. A day passed, two, three, a week, two weeks. Unfortunately, I never saw her again. Of course, I began to be constantly saddened by the fact that I simply didn't know her name. I didn't know who she was. I immediately enrolled in that institute. Studies were in full swing, and only she distracted me from my thoughts. And so, a whole month passed like this. I had somewhat come to terms with the thought that I would never see her again. Although she was in that institute on one of the enrollment days, as I later understood, she wasn't studying there. She appeared in my life for a fleeting moment and disappeared just as quickly, never to return. So, a month passed. One day, when my class was over, I decided to go with a friend to a cafe nearby. We sat at a free table and ordered a cup of coffee. Our conversations were mundane, about studies, future work, tasks for tomorrow. My friend was discussing girls from the institute, but I didn't care. Presumably, initially, he thought I was not traditionally oriented, Oscar chuckled. But suddenly, quite by chance, my gaze fell upon the window. And then, fleetingly, I glanced at the person sitting by that window. Then I looked again, just to be sure. And as you may have already guessed, I was greatly stunned. My excitement became so intense that my palms grew sweaty and my heart pounded twice as fast. My soul wanted to leap out with happiness, and a storm of emotions began swirling endlessly in my head. It was her. The mysterious and alluring stranger with enchanting eyes. She was engrossed in reading some book and smiling as sweetly as she did back then. As she smiled at me in the institute hallway. She hadn't noticed me yet, and I was too afraid to even move slightly. My mood instantly lifted, and I couldn't take my eyes off her. My friend Durant had stepped away to the restroom at that moment, and I pondered many times before approaching her. The whirlpool of endless thoughts overwhelmed me. She must have a fiancé. She's so beautiful, I thought. I didn't approach her while I was alone at the table. Finally, my classmate returned. He immediately noticed that I had been staring relentlessly somewhere and how pale my face had become. Durant also looked in that direction. Do you know her? He asked cheerfully. No, I quickly replied. But would you like to? Well, I don't know. I said hesitantly. Then you do. She probably has a fiancé. She's so beautiful and, presumably, very smart. You won't know until you try, my dear friend, he said, taking a sip of his coffee. But, come on, come on, go talk to her and introduce yourself. Otherwise, you'll regret it later. I can see how you're trembling, and look, your palms are already wet. Obviously, you're really taken by her. I don't know. I'll call her over now, Durant said, already turning towards her. He opened his mouth. No, I exclaimed, closing my eyes to calm down. I'll do it myself. And finally, I gathered my courage. Up to that moment, I had only had one relationship with a girl, so I wasn't skilled in these matters. And I had very little confidence back then. But still, I decided to approach her. I stood up from the chair and walked towards her on shaky legs. It felt like I was walking for five whole minutes, although it lasted less than a minute. Finally, stopping right next to her table, I smiled like a fool. She looked up. Through her eyes, I sensed that she remembered me as if. Hello, she said calmly, smiling sweetly. I opened my mouth but couldn't greet her. 
I felt like a complete idiot. Looking into her eyes, I started drowning in them again. Would you like to sit down? There's space here. I sat at the table. Right in front of her. Up close, she was even more beautiful. Good day, I said as if it wasn't my voice. All of this was due to nervousness. Did you want something? She asked with the same calm and steady voice. Me? No, I mean yes. Of course, yes. Yes, I wanted, I said and fell silent. I wanted to run out of the cafe so as not to embarrass myself anymore. I must have blushed so deeply at that moment that I resembled a tomato. Well, so what? She said slowly, still smiling. Her calmness and composure shook me. Actually, I coughed slightly. Actually, I... I wanted to get to know you. Very much. If you don't mind, of course, I added the last phrase in a quieter voice. She chuckled softly. All right. Let's get acquainted. All right, she said. What's your name? Oscar, and yours? Alisa. My heart wasn't pounding as fiercely anymore. And the atmosphere became much calmer and cozier. Now, it felt like I was next to something familiar and long known. It felt so good and warm inside. Alisa mentioned she remembered me. On the day we first met, she had stepped out onto the street. Alisa also admitted she waited for me to come out of the hall. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. So, she left. But now, we met again. What else could it be if not fate? In the end, we got to know each other successfully. It turned out she was also 20 years old, just like me. On that day, she was in the Institute's hall because her father worked there. Turns out, one of my professors was her father. Sadly, I had quite strained relations with him. For some reason, he didn't like me from the beginning. And later on, he was against his daughter associating with me. We didn't listen to him. We loved each other, dreamed, desired one another. We made plans and lived in each other. After our second meeting, I was sure and understood she was my true destiny. Nothing and no one would stand in our way. I realized I wouldn't love anyone else but her. After we met, we started spending a lot of time together. The third, fifth, tenth, twentieth meeting. Many more meetings and many more loving dates. She fell in love with me almost immediately. I thanked with all my heart the day I decided to invite Durant to the cafe, and I thanked him himself for pushing me to go and meet her. Alisa and I couldn't live without each other anymore. Six months passed of wonderful sweet life. And after those six months, we became like one. Every morning I woke up with the happy thought of seeing her, my best and beautiful Elisa. I loved everything about her, her hair, eyes, facial features, body curves, and bright soul. Elisa intoxicated me more than any high-proof alcohol. All I needed was this thought to love this life. And a year later, we finally began living together. We rarely had any quarrels, and if they did happen, they were over trivial matters. We quickly made up and went out somewhere. In general, a year and a half after we met, I did it. I gathered my courage and made her the desired proposal. We got married almost immediately. My parents lived in another city, and from Alice's parents, only her father was still against it, being a miser. On the contrary, her mother was happy for her daughter and our marriage. Now I had a wife, with whom we lived in our own house. My studies were at the highest level. I was studying to become a rescuer. I always wanted to help people in distress. And soon enough, I was able to combine studying and working. It was tough, but I managed. Often, on cold evenings, Alice and I loved to sing one song together. Perhaps you heard it while I was humming it, sitting in our house, Oscar chuckled. I'm sorry if it caused you any inconvenience. And on one of my birthdays, Alice gave me a guitar, the same one that's lying on the table now. She always liked how I played it for her. Her eyes were full of delight and sparkle. Besides the guitar, she also gave me this wonderful straw hat 
the old man said, taking off the hat. On one ordinary day, we decided to go to an amusement park. We chose the Ferris wheel. And only when we reached the very top, Alice realized she was terribly afraid of such heights. So I held her as close to me as possible and suggested she just close her eyes. After that, I started quietly humming our favorite song to her. And Alice relaxed a little in my strong embrace. She could open her eyes again and fully calm down. Half a year into our married life, we found out that Alice was pregnant. Our happiness knew no bounds. It seemed like we were the happiest people on this planet. I felt uplifted again. Uplifted like on the first day of our meeting. At 23, I had the best job, a wife, and a child. Alice gave birth to a boy. We named him Adrian. Playing songs on the guitar wasn't enough for me. I started composing poems for my love. There was a whole box of them. When she read my poems, I listened to her voice with excitement. I also continued to cherish her and adore her to the core. After some time, Alice became pregnant again. A girl was born who was an exact copy of Alice. We named her Augusta. As it became clear earlier, we used to live in another city. Alice was involved in sewing various clothes and making jewelry. And as I mentioned earlier, I loved saving people. Working in the emergency services, I fervently believed that I was doing the best thing possible. So we lived together for a whole six years. Six years soul to soul. Six years of pure joy, happiness, and eternal pleasure. A life full of harmony and fulfillment. Adrian was already four years old, and little Augusta was three. But one day turned my life upside down forever. It influenced everything. Absolutely everything. It was the most horrible and inevitable event in my life. That day was August 10th. I had a shift at work, and Alice had a day off. The three of them were at home. Unfortunately, at home. Oscar's face became the opposite of what it was. He continued. Then, I returned from work. I didn't have to get close to the house to understand what was happening. Huge clouds of smoke were rising into the air above our house. And the fire was so bright and blazing that it blinded the eyes. The fire truck was already parked nearby. Where are they? I shouted. Who? The firefighter asked without thinking. My children and wife? They're being rescued, he replied after a few seconds. I wanted to rush into the house. I heard them calling for me. But those cries were already beyond consciousness. I heard and saw nothing. I just wanted to save them. But even that I couldn't do, because the next minute, one of the firefighters carried out two bodies. Another firefighter carried out the third body. They were all unconscious. I hurried to them. Now they were lifeless. Medical assistance was attempted on the spot, but it was futile. Now, once joyful and lively faces had turned into silent ones with permanently closed eyes. They no longer spoke or laughed. My children no longer called me daddy and my wife, her beloved. They were dead. For a long time, I didn't want to acknowledge it. Didn't want to acknowledge that damn fire took their lives. The life of my Alice and the lives of my precious children. The whole house simply burned to the ground. At work, they offered me to take a vacation. To recover and rest properly. But I didn't need rest. If I had gone on vacation, it would have been a hundred times worse. And then, it was decided. Decided to find all the strength and move on. To help people like them and not allow them to die like that. I always tried to save as many lives as possible. And I knew Alice would only be happy about that. Happy that I didn't drink myself to death and didn't lose myself. Happy that I continued to live on, even though it was with great difficulty. I continued to cherish and seize the best moments of this fleeting life. By age, I was already entitled to a pension. So I decided to leave that city forever. Never to return. I moved to different cities. One city, then another, and a third. Nothing suited. But then, I stopped at this one. 
I no longer worked, lived on a pension. But one day, I saw a house on fire. There were no firefighters yet. A girl was standing near the porch, begging for help. Please help. My little daughter is inside. Please. I didn't say anything. I rushed into the house, found the child, and pulled her out. It was you, Ines. Ines shed one tear, then another. Then she started sobbing and approached Oscar. She didn't say anything. She just hugged the old man tightly. He didn't expect this. And he was shocked again. I'm sorry, Oscar. Please forgive us. I was so stupid, Ines said through tears. And then, Martina and Ursula joined her. Pablo, Benjamin, and Castor were in complete shock and regret. They pondered all this information. Undoubtedly, they felt very sorry for the old man. They all hated themselves for what they had done. I never thought you were a bad person, Oscar. Mateo ran up to the old man and hugged him. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. And let's fly a kite on the weekend. Well, I don't know. That's up to your parents. Mom, Dad, can we? The child asked hopefully. Of course, son, we can. Of course. Now, almost every weekend, neighbors loved spending time with Oscar Moreno. At every opportunity, they apologized for their terrible treatment of him. They helped him with money and no longer allowed him to collect bottles. In the evenings, they listened to his songs. On one of the holidays, Oscar and Mateo, as usual, flew a kite. The sky was azure and clear. You're my best friend, Mateo said. And you, Mateo. Forever my best little friend. Dear viewers, If you enjoyed the story, please support the video by liking it and leaving a comment. Thank you very much.